Hello! Welcome back, everybody! This is our final video in our series on Chapter 4, where we are looking at quantitative data. Quantitative data. Um, looking at the displays and the ways that we describe uh, a, a quantitative data set. So, in our previous videos, we talked about uh, the center and the shape, not the centers, the center and the shape. And in this last video, we're going to talk about the spread. So you want to you want to be able to describe the shape, center, and spread uh, whenever you are describing a quantitative data set, or uh, most likely, usually a histogram. Okay, so let's talk about spread a little bit. And the reason why I do this in a separate video is there's a lot of info on spread that maybe you did cover in some of your other um, maybe uh, early statistics courses. Okay, so. How spread out is the distribution? Variation matters, and statistics is all about variation. When we say variation, it means how, uh, how tightly clustered around the center are the, are the data values. Are they really close, or are they really far away? Okay, we always want to report a measure of spread along with a measure of center when we're describing a, a distribution numerically, because Things can have the same mean, but have vastly different standard deviations, which makes their distributions totally different. For example, uh, if we were to have a distribution that was uh, like this, very tightly compressed uh, around the center, right? Here's your mean, right? And uh, most of the data is very, very close to that mean. That is a totally different situation than something like this here. In both cases, the mean, the, the mean could be the same, right? Uh, let's call it 10, right? Okay, the, the mean of both of these uh, distributions could be 10, but this is vastly different type of distribution because the spread is so different, right? If we were trying to, uh, say, uh, do something accurately or make an accurate prediction, uh, this kind of distribution on the left would be really good. We could make a more accurate prediction because most of the data is in the right area or in the center area, so it would be easier to have an accurate prediction, whereas over here, the data is so spread out that making an accurate prediction would be very difficult. So this could be come into play in, in many different types of situations, whether you're um, trying to uh, do something in physics where you're shooting a, a catapult and you want it to land in a certain area, uh, but it could also be really important in like building situations you know you're trying to figure out the tensile strength of the rivets that go into your airplane wing you don't want something that has weird fail rates that are totally spread out you want that stuff on lockdown because if a plane wing falls off uh, then obviously people are going to die okay so you want uh, there are situations where it's really important that the data set uh, be, be really close together. So um, the spread is a really important thing to look at. We have a few different ways of measuring the spread. The first is the range. And the range of the data is the difference between the maximum and minimum values. So you just take the biggest value, subtract the smallest value. Um, it's a good way of seeing the total difference in your distribution. However, uh, a big disadvantage of this is that if there is any extreme values, it m m makes that number not as useful. Okay, uh, Anything with, a, with an outlier, suddenly your range is going to be much bigger and therefore maybe not representative of the spread. Okay, So the range we can look at just to see a top to bottom, how, how far does this go. Uh, we can also look at what's called the interquartile range. And the interquartile range lets us ignore the extreme data values and just concentrate what's on the middle of the data. Of the data. So to find the interquartile range, uh, we need to know what quartiles are. So you may have done these uh, way back in the day uh, in your seventh grade stat stats section that you did. Um, but the quartiles basically break up a data set. So you've got uh, the minimum, 
and then you've got in the middle you've got the median and then on the end you've got the max between the median and the max you have quartile three and between the me the minimum and the median you have quartile one here you have four quartiles right you've got the smallest quartile you've got uh the quartile the second quartile here which is uh, sort of in the middle and then you've got the third quartile and the fourth quartile notice that they break the data into quarters or quartiles um the interquartile range is the difference between the upper quartile here, right? The quartile three, also known as the upper quartile, uh, and the lower quartile. So we're looking at the middle 50%, okay? The middle 50%. That allows us to look at the middle, ignoring the extreme values, uh, that might come from looking at the min and the max. So, for example, uh, this is that earthquake data again. This minimum is very small and far away from the rest of the data. The interquartile range tells us the middle 50%, and that's just this area right in here. So seeing the difference in the middle 50%, uh, can help us maybe get a much better idea of just how spread out the data values are. Because if we know where the median is, we can see how big of a difference the middle 50% is. Is the middle 50% very spread out? Or is the middle 50% fairly close together? Because in general, if the middle 50% is very spread out, then the rest of the data will also be very spread out. Okay. So interquartile range measures between the quartiles. Uh, here we have the five number summary. This is a, a summary of the, the five um, uh, numbers, extremes, uh, quartiles, whatever, uh, that when you look at a data set you might see. We're going to use this more in the next chapter when we make what's called a box and whisker plot. Uh, you probably heard of that before. Hopefully, you saw that in one of your, you know, seventh grade statistics things. Uh, but we're going to use that more a little bit later. So we're going to kind of skip that and talk about this really important thing called the standard deviation. So the standard deviation is kind of the best measurement of spread. IQR is good. It works in situations when the standard deviation doesn't. Um, but the standard deviation is is the best, right? Um, what the standard deviation does is it takes into account how far each data value is from the mean. So a deviation is the distance that a data value is from the mean. Since we're adding all the deviations together with total zero, we square each deviation and find an average of sorts for these deviations. So to give you kind of a picture for that, imagine that this is your mean right here. The standard deviation is taking uh, every data point. So let's let's draw in some uh, some bars here to do this example. I cannot draw bars. It's just awful. Um, what the standard deviation does is it takes every single point of data in this bar and it measures how far it is from this mean value in the center. So we're taking all of them, every single data value. We're going to take every single data value in the entire set, and we're going to calculate how far away it is from this mean right here. And then we find an average of those deviations. So we calculate all these distances, and then we find the average of those distances to see what the average distance from the mean is. <coughs> There's a formula for it. Uh, we have to start by calculating the variance, that is the, the difference in things. Uh, this right here means take the sum, in case you're not sure of that notation. Uh, we're going to take the sum of all data points from the, the mean minus the data point. We square them, and then we divide that all by n minus 1. Now, the standard deviation is the square root of that number. So let's do a really quick example with like five numbers just to show you how this works. So my five numbers are going to be one, two, three, four, five. 
uh, we can calculate this. Uh, we need to, to be able to fill out our formula here. We need to know the mean. So that, that y value is the mean. This is our data point, whatever data point we're looking at. And this is the uh, sample size or the number of numbers in the set. All right, so let's go ahead and do that for this set that we have here. First of all, we need to calculate the mean. Uh, calculating the mean in this case is going to be, I'm just erasing this for space. Uh, calculating the mean, uh, we could actually do the math here, but I can tell you that it's going to be three. Um, but if you really don't, if you don't trust me, nine, 12, 14, 15 divided by five is three. So my mean <coughs> is three. Oh, I just realized I totally messed something up. Ignore this. I did this backwards. This is the mean. And this is the data value. Oh, I'm a terrible person. <clears throat> but I'm not redoing the video because I'm like 10 minutes in, 12 minutes in, and uh, I, can't, I can't edit it. My editing skills are not that good. So your erasing skills are better than my, my editing skills. So, you know, you can fix it that way. This is still the sample size. I didn't mess that one up. All right, so let's do this. The mean is uh, 3. Therefore, my y bar equals 3. So let's do it. <clears throat> I need to take uh, all of these. I need to take the difference of all of these and square them. So I'm going to do 1 minus 3 squared, right? So that's my data value minus my mean squared. The sum says take all of those and add them together. So then I'm going to do 2 minus 3 squared. And then I'm going to do 3 minus 3 squared. And then I'm going to do 4 minus 3 squared. And then I'm going to do 5 minus 3 squared. <sighs> OK. Uh, so I got to take the sum of all of these things. OK, so that's negative 2 squared, which is 4. This is negative 1 squared, which is 1. This is 0 squared, which is 0. This is 1 squared, so it's 1. This is um, 2 squared again, so it's 4. Adding these together, it looks like I'm getting 10. OK. So that part right here is 10. So calculating my standard deviation, I've got 10 divided by n minus 1, which is 5 minus 1. Uh, so we're, we're, st we're sitting here at the square root of 10 over 4, or the square root of uh, 5 halves. And uh, we can calculate the square root of 5 halves. Let's see, two, 5 halves is, uh, what, 2.5, right? Uh, square root of 2.5. So this is going to give us somewhere between 1 and 2. Uh, there's an exact value that we can calculate for it, but um, you know I don't have a calculator handy. So the square root of 2.5, that's my standard deviation. It tells me that the average distance away from the mean here is going to be uh, about uh, 1.5. OK? Good news is, in general, we don't calculate standard deviations by hand. I showed you this so you know what's happening, but in general, if you've got a teacher who's making you calculate all of your standard deviations by hand, they're probably Satan. Like, they're probably literally the devil because they're just being mean to you for no reason at all, right? Uh, so stand up in your classroom and say, no, Satan, I will not calculate standard deviations by hand, and then uh, grab your calculator and use that, OK? Uh, I'll have another video uh, in this uh, series where we're going to go over all of the calculator commands that, that happen uh, with this. So you can watch that one next. But we almost always use software to calculate this, because this is how much work we had to do for five numbers. And no data set has five numbers. Data sets have anywhere from like 30 to thousands. So we don't calculate it by hand because it would just be murder, all right? Um, but you did need to see how this works, and that's important, okay? Uh, so let's talk a little bit about a little bit more about spread, and then we'll uh, and then we'll end it here. So statistics is all about this variation. Uh, this idea of spread is a fundamental concept of statistics, okay? Measures of spread help us talk about what we don't know. When the data values are tightly clustered around the center of distribution, the IQR and the standard deviation will be small. Whereas when the data values are scattered far away from the center, the IQR and the standard deviation will be very large. 
the, this difference in how things are spread out plays a huge impact on the data set that you are looking at. In fact, in most cases, if you're reading some kind of journalism uh, that they report a mean, but they don't report a standard deviation, you should automatically be dubious of what this report is telling you. Because they're either A, not telling you the standard deviation because uh, <clears throat> they don't understand it themselves, and they, so they're not reporting it because they don't think other people understand it, which, by the way, means you shouldn't trust them because they're not good journalists. Or B, they're trying to hide something from you, and you shouldn't, you shouldn't be trusting anything if they're trying to hide something from you. So you should always see a mean with a standard deviation or uh, a median with an interquartile range because they go together, right? We need to talk about center and spread, not just center. Centers don't mean anything by themselves. You need a spread to talk about it as well. Let's, uh, so that's the end of our chapter four stuff. Let's talk about some of the things that can go wrong here. Um, and we'll do this fairly quickly here. Don't make a histogram of categorical data. You simply can't do it. Categorical data doesn't work, okay? Um, don't look for shape center spread of a bar chart. A histogram is okay to look for shape center spread, but on a bar chart, it doesn't make sense because categorical data just doesn't work, okay? Um, don't use bars in every display. You want to save them for histograms and bar charts. This kind of thing down here uh, can, be, can be damaging, right? These are uh, a badly drawn plot and a proper histogram for the number of juvenile bald eagles cited in a collection. Uh, notice the difference here uh, is it's the number of juveniles along the x-axis not the week. This is, I saw one in the fourth week. I saw six in the seventh week. I saw two in the eighth week. That's going over time, which is not a histogram, right? That's bad. The x-axis should be the number of juveniles cited, and this should be the number of weeks that I saw that happen, okay? Uh, choose a bin width that is appropriate to the data. Uh, changing the midwidth changes the appearance of the histogram. This is that uh, earthquake data. Uh, if you do it with too large of a bin width, you end up with an uninteresting graph. If you do it with too large of a bin width, or sorry, uh, too small of a bin width, then you end up getting something where it's harder to see these patterns because you're seeing each individual bar, okay? So you want to choose something right in the middle that gives you an interesting graph uh, without being like, every single number in the data set, okay? Here's a bunch, right? Don't forget to do the reality check, okay? And don't let the calculator do the thinking for you. Make sure that it makes sense. Don't forget to sort the values before finding the median or percentiles. It's got to go from smallest, smallest to largest, right? If you're not ordering them, then the median and quartiles don't mean anything. Don't worry about small differences when using the different methods. Don't compute numerical summaries of a categorical variable. If you have a categorical variable, it doesn't make sense to calculate the mean or the standard deviation because those things don't exist. Don't report too many decimal places. Uh, you want to do two or three max, okay? You don't want to go out 10 decimal places. It doesn't make sense. However, you don't want to round in the middle of a calculation. You want to make sure that as you're calculating multiple things that you're using the full amount of uh, decimals that you have. Otherwise, you are going to create er an error uh, in, your, in your data. Watch out for multiple modes. If you've got a, multi -mode, a multimodal thing, you want to be aware of outliers because they can change your data set. And most importantly, make a picture, make a picture, make a picture. Numbers by themselves don't make sense. You need displays for yourself so that you can find interesting patterns and for other people who are viewing your data set so that it makes it more interesting to see what you, so that they can understand what you're doing, all right? Okay, that's the last of what we got for chapter four. I will have one more video from chapter four that is going to have all of the TI calculator techniques for things that you might need in this chapter, like creating a list, 
finding the five number summary, calculating standard deviation and mean, and making a histogram. So that'll be coming up, uh, it should be next in the playlist. So uh, you can check that out if you're needing some help with the TIs. Otherwise, thank you very much for watching. If you have questions, comments, concerns, please leave them in the comments. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks for watching. I will see you another time.